Hey, welcome, welcome back to the Day Palmer Show. And with me today, I have someone who went from Playboy cover girl and centerfold to the top 5% in her profession nationwide in the USA. Deborah Driggs, welcome to the Day Palmer Show. Hey, everybody. Thank hey. you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Deborah, I'm so glad you are here. I'm so glad you are here. Hello. We're uh, on opposite sides of the pond. We so are. We are. Actually, we, we're normally across the pond from each other, but I haven't been to London since the lockdown. So I've been um, working for a company in Australia, but I'm actually in the Philippines. It's not a bad wow. place, actually. Not a bad place to, to spend the lockdown. So, uh, so there you I'm, go. I'm, I'm pretty content. There's some beautiful, beautiful beaches. And, there is. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, a lot of the, and things a lot, to explore. That's right. A lot of your Hollywood actresses uh, spend uh, a bit of time there in Palawan, the place you're describing with the caves. And that's more the serene part. The party island is Barocco. But anyway, <laughs> there's yeah, a bit of everything beautiful. for everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, it's Deborah, on my bucket list. I have not been, but I oh, know, uh, there's like hundreds of islands that you can go to. Let, let's arrange that. Let's arrange that. Actually, there's yeah. hundreds of places you can go around there as well, not only in the Philippines, but there's Bali, there's Australia, there's, uh, Lovely. you know. Hong Kong, China, and uh, I've know, done Thailand. Hong Kong. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I've been a lot. It's only two hours away from here. But anyway, let's not yeah. get into travel because I want you to talk about what you do now. But before we talk <laughs> about that, Deborah, tell us all about your life. I mean, obviously, you, you landed on the pages of a Playboy, but before you landed there, what, what were you doing? Uh, I mean, did you go straight from high school? Where, where, where were you from in the States? I just, you know what? I was born and then I was on Playboy. Wow. <laughs> you know, just boom. No, it just oh, all no, happened no. overnight. No, 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 come on. <laughs> no, 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 no. I was born in Southern California. Yeah. In LA. And I grew up in LA and um, San Diego. And, uh, no, Los Angeles. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In the That's South a vast area. area, though. Yeah, it's a vast area. So yeah. uh, San Diego is about two hours from LA. Okay. Well, it's not too far either. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I grew up in the South Bay area. Yeah. And which is a little bit closer to L.A. And, you know, I um, my mom had me doing commercials at a very young age. And then yeah, yeah. I kind of went into figure skating and oh, I was okay. a figure skater. Yeah, it was figure skating. And so I always what thought distance? I was going to be in a... distance. What does that mean? Uh, I mean, figure skating because I used to be a uh, track runner. So it's kind of like figure skating, but without the skates. <laughs> like you see, kind of like running around, uh, yeah. skating around uh, track. No, I didn't do. I didn't do speed skating. Oh, so sorry. Yeah. All oh, right. Fig oh, figure. figure yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. with you. Yeah. The sorry, I got mixed up with the words. There. Ballet. Think <laughs> I'm ballet with you now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm with so you. So I did figure skating, and then um, so I really thought that that was going to be my. I was going to be an ice yeah. skater and I was, yeah, yeah. you know, and I was going to be in the ice capades, you know, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. or I'd go to the Olympics, you know, I was, yeah. I just thought that that was going to be my whole life. And then um, in about 1983, I started doing commercials and a little bit of catalog modeling. And in 1989, after I had been doing commercials and, and modeling for a bit, yeah. I got a call from my agent that Playboy wanted to meet with me. And what was and your they were coming out with? Yeah, what was your thoughts then? Were, well, they were coming out with a new book called the Lingerie Book. Okay. And so my agent said, Yeah, they want to see you for the cover. And I said, Well, is there any nudity involved? And she's like, I don't think so. It's for the cover. Yeah. So I go to the famous building on Sunset and go for the audition. And next thing I know, they're giving me a robe and telling me to take my clothes off and they're going to do a Polaroid. And I said, no, no, I'm not here for that. I'm here to yeah, yeah. do the cover of the new book. Yeah. And, uh, and they were like, yeah, but everything we do involves, we need to see your body, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, right. you know, I didn't really think about this at the time, but back then they were really looking for scars and birthmarks and tattoos and piercings and things oh, like really? that. Well, because yeah, they didn't like it, was, it or because they wanted it. I suppose because well, they wanted it. Well, no, because it was a different time, and, oh, and right. back then, no, they 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 wanted a clean slate, right? And right. so it was a very different time, you know, in the world, and now nobody would care. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's a different. So they just wanted to see what they were working with, and so I didn't disrobe, and I just took the Polaroid and I left, and I thought, well, I'm not going to get that because obviously I'm already difficult. And so I got a call that afternoon that they want to shoot me to be a centerfold for the magazine. And I was like, 
I think you're confusing me with, with another girl. Like, yeah, yeah. I think there's a mix up. So I called my agent. She's like, no, they want you to shoot to be a centerfold. And I'm like, oh my God. Really? Me? <laughs> but like, I, I mean, the thing about it is that I think I'm not sure at that time, Playboy was actually kind of main, he managed to get it mainstreamed. Uh, I forgot his name. I know he died, the owner of Playboy. I don't know if you met him before. But, Hugh Hefner. Uh, yeah, Hugh Hefner. Um, yeah. You did it was him, the number one magazine in the world. He, he he made an amazing job of actually getting it mainstream, a bit like Sports Illustrated, but the kind of like for the entertainment world bigger. as opposed to. Yeah, it was bigger it was than bigger. Sports bigger. Illustrated. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. it was the entertainment version of Sports Illustrated, you know, so it's kind you know, of. Yeah. You know, yeah, it was the biggest magazine in the world. Yeah. And yeah. what his vision was I mean the advertising and just the glamour and what he did for men you know it wasn't just it wasn't really the magazine wasn't really intended to be a magazine about a centerfold yeah. the magazine was intended to show men how to have a very high class life yeah yeah what cool cigars to smoke what suits to wear yeah that's what I mean it's a lifestyle it's more of a lifestyle pockets, thing yeah how to yeah how to wear a pocket square how to drive a Maserati you know it was a men's magazine a men's club, so to speak, and the centerfold was just the added bonus. Yeah, and but I mean, so, he did. A, Hugh Hefner did an amazing job to to actually bring it like that, as opposed to getting it like um, you know, like you say, like a sleazy adult kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, no, because, it was beautiful. Yeah, 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 because um, there was a lot of um, kind of like politicians and you know, like well, well uh, respected people that that he made friends with as well that, that kind of like endorsed it not endorsed it but you know oh, didn't have uh, a bad word to them. say yeah, yeah no they and they all did interviews in the magazine and you know it's it, the joke was always oh well I get that magazine to read the articles but it really wasn't a joke because the articles were always way ahead of their time and he was always on the cutting edge of whatever was happening socially and and around the world and yeah, you know, he interviewed Malcolm X. I mean, it was it was wow, yeah. the That's articles I mean, were yeah. no yeah, the articles were no joke. So when people say, Oh yeah, you're reading Playboy for the articles, but yeah, yeah. you know, it's really but not a joke. Cause the thing about it, when you say oh yeah, Playboy, um I um I joined the fire service in nineteen ninety, but when I was growing up as a kid, uh I, I grew up near London Bridge. Um, it, well, you've heard of London Bridge, obviously. <laughs> it's a very famous name. Yes. But, uh, um, but the time when I was growing up there, now it's like a real, um, uh, it's a new, new, new kind of place. You know, it's like just modern buildings all around. But it wasn't when I was growing up there, it was all old docks that closed down and warehouses, but some paper factories are still going on. And then there's waste paper factories around. Some of those had a load of magazines and a lot of them were playboy magazines that were scattered around the place so i was like a kid i don't know i suppose i didn't really know much then you know it's like it's just turning in my early teens to uh, just before my teens as well and oh, what these magazines do really? and it's pretty bad really to sort of leave them but obviously as kids you can still get through the gate and sort of see them and, yeah. and stuff like that but the they did make fun of it because they knew Playboy, you know because obviously you saw the the front page and the center fold you know and things like that i mean um so this was like in the 70s and early 80s for me um well yeah, yeah late 70s anyway um and so th there was a kind of teasing thing about <laughs> oh play well oh, yeah you know when <laughs> we managed to pull a few few of the things thinking what's this you know um but of course now getting older as a t late late teens you start to learn about what the you know articles were going in them and things like that and it wasn't such a, a big tease as it was you know with the real adult entertainment world you know um so so yeah i mean one of the questions because i did have uh, uh, uh someone on my show before and she was a photographer for emily i can't remember her name now emily something but she she left it because she said there were some bad things that the bad side she saw from from being a photographer in playboy and so she left oh. and then she became a, a campaigner but but how was you treated as a playmate there I was actually treated really well. I, you know, I, everything that was done was done really first class, yeah. you know, I mean, it was, I don't think Hef would have risked his reputation, yeah, at yeah. least during the time that I was involved to do anything that would be, you know, yeah, yeah. It was, I mean, it was, it was all on the up and up. You knew what you were doing. It wasn't like, it wasn't like you were being taken into a dark room and 
take off your clothes and it wasn't a secret you knew yeah, you were yeah. shooting a centerfold and yeah and then you know everything was done beautifully and i was treated with the utmost respect and nothing weird ever happened as far as during my shoot or on the set and you know i mean they would bring luncheon from la dome i mean i was treated so well i was like lunch was being brought in from very fancy five-star restaurants and it was just always like what can we do for you deb are you, you feel good are you are you okay because it's a long it's a long you know it's a very long shoot it's six to eight weeks of shooting and oh, six to eight weeks. a lot of lighting and a lot of posing and a lot of you know so it's it looks really glamorous when it comes out but there's a yeah. lot of work that goes into it and yeah yeah i i just so yeah, yeah it was all it was all up and up and i i loved i loved my time that i got with hef and you know the the time up at the mansion these these are memories that will never go away yeah yeah no that's that's, that's amazing I, I have some good memories of things i did but i i only dabbled with you know a bit of kind of I, I did sports, so I managed to get, you know, um, pulled up uh, for some, you know, it was on a reasonable level, but I wasn't famous, but uh, I did do the Olympic trials and did some big, big championships and, you know, televised and it's on YouTube. But anyway, I managed to get some sponsorship and some photo opportunities and, and a couple of films, which I was in with uh, some Hollywood, famous Hollywood, British actors that were in big Hollywood movies and stuff like that. So, uh, um so that that gave me a few opportunities but that's really through the sports and you know obviously i was working as a firefighter so that was like a big kind of like uh <laughs> the, those days it was oh wow a firefighter you know that kind of thing i think i still absolutely say yeah yeah it's exactly most yeah. well respected <laughs> exactly yeah yeah so so for so me much... i was in that that world you know so uh yeah um both in sports and 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 that and uh you know that prof profession as yeah. well combined um but for you being being obviously playboy was kind of your first step to to give you a stepping stone if you like how, how did that open doors for you i don't know if it was my first step it it you know for me because i was already in la and i was already aspiring i was already aspiring to act and i had already had commercials under my belt i already had my sag card you know i i had agents I, it, it wasn't my first step it was it was more of I remember it was more of a choice like, okay, is this the direction I want my career to go in? Because I, I had long conversations with the representation that I had back then. And they said, you know, well, you're definitely not going to be the girl next door for commercials anymore. Cause I was doing family catalog work and, and stuff like that. Oh, so, right. okay. so you mean, you mean, the, um, after during playboy or, or after you're doing those before, before Playboy, I had discussions with my representation as yeah. to whether or not this would be the, the course that I would want my career to go, because back then it was a big deal. Oh, and right. a lot of the advertisers were not going to hire me now because I'm posing oh, right. nude okay, in a magazine. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. we had to have these discussions. And so so it definitely changed the course of of where I where I was and where I was going. And it, yeah, definitely opened up doors all of a sudden now. Everybody wanted to meet with me and bring me in for different different projects that they were working on. And all of a sudden there was interest and, you know, so it, it was definitely a door opener. And, and you know, I, I remember I, my issue came out in February and I got to do the Valentine special on the Oprah Winfrey show. and. Oh, wow. And then I got to go to Acapulco to do the Bob Hope special just because wow, it, it just yeah. all coincided with my issue coming out. Yeah, yeah. And it helped that I was on the cover of the following month, which was also very unusual. And so I had two months of back to back. I was the centerfold and then I was on the cover. And, and then all of a sudden I'm now the VJ for Playboy's Hot Rocks. It was just like a whirlwind of events that just kept, it just, it just kept going. And, and so, you know, from that, I went down a different road. I, 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 I kind of got away from the catalog and commercial work that I was doing and went into a different space, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it was a, definitely a door opener, of course. You know, I, I was in proximity of people I probably wouldn't have been in proximity yeah, yeah. of just from being up at the mansion. I mean, everybody went to the mansion and, and you know, 
What, what what's the experience like in the mansion? I've probably never asked this before, actually. <laughs> Just to kind of like uh, give a give an exclusive it's, there. It's everything and more that you can imagine. It's just right. the most decadent. Uh, it is the mansion. I mean, it's a, it. He had a full time zookeeper and lots of animals and lots of birds and lots of oh, property right, okay. and yeah 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 and you know it's just normal guess- it's just normal but obviously you know just someone living that kind of lifestyle with you know so i suppose yeah. in london in london you'll find that in mayfair you know park lane kensington we have areas like that where it's ultra you know rich uh, and you've got probably yeah. places in la that's like that very high end you know yeah and so so that's what you're going to see really so yeah um, for me, it's normal because as a firefighter, I, you know, it didn't matter where we, we rescued ultra rich pop stars, you know, to, to, to very poor people, you know, so course, I, I've seen everything <laughs> and, you know, we have to get, we have the right to go and get access, you know, more than a police officer of anything, you know, cause they have to have a warrant, yeah. you know, it's, well, it's a warrant for us, but it's also massive once they say there's a fire, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um so yeah i've been in those places uh in terms of obviously in a, for a sad way well actually for doing fire checks as well so we did it for, yeah. for both things i mean i've been in buckingham palace i went past where the queen used to sit and you know but obviously oh, yeah, in a work, you know in, yeah. in parliament which is saying congress you know i sat on the chair where the the prime minister sits you know <laughs> so only amazing. because they were doing checks you know but uh, yeah, that's a course. different that's a different thing but in my pr- private life, when I was doing these uh, photo shoots and, and films and that, I did have some friends that, like, one was a friend of Peter Stringfellas, so he invited me to a couple of his parties and, and things like that. You know, he's a pho- photographer as well, actually, so he did similar kind of photography. Yeah. Um, so I did meet people in that industry that, that just, it felt normal. Uh, I don't know, have you heard of Peter Stringfeller, by the way? I have not. No, no, okay, yeah. It's got a club in Miami as well. Boy, he, sorry, he's, he's, he passed away as well, but... Uh, uh, it's similar to Pete, Hugh Hefner, but on a, on a British kind of version way, really. Oh, uh, yeah, yes, of course. Yeah, I, yeah, I know, yeah. Who, but it was I know more, who we're talking about. That's yeah. right, but he's more of a club person rather than... Yeah. So he did a similar thing. He, did, he made it go mainstream to stop looking sleazy, but it kind of... Yeah. Um, so what I'm trying to say is getting back to the mansion, it, it kind of like, you, you don't really see that really. You know, it's just a normal life, but obviously in the high end part of living, that's all it was really, wasn't it, I suppose? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not, it's definitely not in your everyday, you know, you know, just being there, you, and, and, you know, and putting it aside from whether it was this or that, just being there on its own was a very special experience. It just, it exuded his vision of yeah. what, of what Playboy was about. You know, it was a place for, the girls to go and have movie night on Friday night and yeah, yeah. Sunday night was Sunday night dinner and you went up and he had a beautiful buffet and, and he had, you know, it was just, it was, it was, it was a place to watch movies, to play backgammon and to socialize with a who's who and be in proximity of people you wouldn't normally be in proximity of. And that's what made it so special, you know, yeah. is that you could be sitting next to, Merv Griffin one night and George Clooney the next, you know, you just yeah, didn't yeah. know. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, well, that's a, that's a, that's a life in itself. <laughs> but uh, so you opened doors for you. Did you do movies and, and stuff like that? Or I did. I had, yeah. you know, a, a, a short, you know, acting career. I did a few yeah, yeah. things, you know, no, nothing mainstream, did a few pilots and um, you know, in 1990 I got married in 92 and in 1998 I decided that I was going to be a full-time mom I had three children at this point and decided to be a full-time mom and so you know that you know it was really hard to juggle auditioning and yeah trying to keep up with that so yeah auditioning and also waiting around because I did a couple of movies as I say that you know the one with the Hollywood (laughs) people you're waiting around in the makeup area for ages and then you're doing a shoot waiting down to two hours oh let's do another one and by the time you know the six hours are gone it's the evening and you've got to do another one and you're a bit tired you know (laughs) so that's that's a long day for for a full-time mother isn't it really if you're continuously doing that so it's a very long day yeah and And, and movies movies are the same as doing those shoots you know it could take weeks as well you know absolutely just to do what for one little kind of 10 minute <laughs> clip sometimes you know so yeah um yep. okay so so you became a mother um uh so three children you've got yeah about three yes yeah 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 and um 
1998 where was your life going then um obviously it's, it's you know house being a house house of my mother you know alone is one of the most um you know people say oh they you know housewives and mothers should, should be paid you know like a, a full-time paid job you know it should be very highly respected so yeah. what no i mean that's what people say because obviously when you think about it if you if you pay people to do the sort of jobs you had to do that's a lot of money you pay a child mind or a cook a chef or you know um, everything else and then the, the fact that you're managing it all you know as a mother that's a, that's a lot isn't it really so you're paying a manager as well it's <laughs> but, so yeah it's a, it's everything it's, yeah yeah and uh, you're also you know be it doing the security the, the making sure <laughs> everything's safe you know things like that so uh, <laughs> until the, yeah. the, obviously the husband comes home or, or whatever but even then it's a, a joint thing isn't it really so uh what, what, what was going on then uh, from 1998? Um, because obviously you had a transition in career. So before, during that 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 gap, what, what was going on that transition? Well, you know, I mean, here's the deal. You know, I, I I had my stint in the entertainment business, and then, you know, got divorced and had to reinvent myself. And right, I didn't okay. leave my divorce with any type of big what, alimony. When was that? When, when was the divorce then? I got divorced in 2003. Oh, right. Okay. And so I had to work, you know, I had to go back to work and I had to figure okay. it out. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, that's what kind of led me on this journey of like, okay, I did this. So now what? And got into the business world of, you know, working in an office and selling real estate. And I had no idea how to do a fax or scan a paper. Oh, really? And so, okay. And so when I met with, uh, I got my real estate license in 2005. Yeah. And I met with the top realtor to work with him. And I said, I don't know how to do anything in the office. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I, my skill set is, is that of, you know, I've been in the entertainment world my yeah, whole yeah. life. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, he was actually really supportive. He said, you know, well, are you good with people? And I was like, yeah, actually, I'm really good with people. And he said, well, I can teach you all the marketing and all the office and do all that. You just come in and do your thing. And you handle my listings and my clients. And I think we, right. we could be a match, you know? Yeah, and yeah. so it worked so great. And I learned so much. And that was kind of my first stint in the business world. And I remember I'd, I, I started getting more listings, you know, I'd sit up in houses and people would come in and they were like, well, you should list my house. And I'd be like, okay. And so I'd go back to the office and I'd go to the girls and I'd go, how do you do that scan thing again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they just <laughs> laugh at me. They're like, she yeah, brings yeah. in a $3 million listing, but she doesn't know how to use, I don't know how to do yeah, any yeah, of the yeah. office stuff. And they were just like, oh my God. And they were just, it, it, it became like the inside joke in the office. Cause like she could do this, but I couldn't figure that out. But by the time I left that, that job, you know, I knew how to yeah. do everything. And, All right. um, okay, yeah. and I really, um, so that was 2005. You left uh, just after that then. <clears throat> well, in 2008, we know what happened. Yeah. You yeah, know, the yeah. market, the market crash, my, That's I right, was living yeah. in, Park City, Utah, and yeah, the housing crisis was 2007 as well, just before that, wasn't it? Yep, and eight, and so my market was probably the one of the first to go, which was second home, luxury, multi-million dollar homes. People oh, were trying right. to get okay, rid of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So again, now I'm back to no money, no job. <laughs> wow. You know, wow, wow. reinvent again. Yeah. And so you know that. I, you go through all these things, right? You go through all these twists and turns, you go through all these things, and then you figure out that it's okay. You know, it's okay to keep starting over. It's okay to keep getting back up. And I didn't really know. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. And it was like really frustrating for me because at this point I'm in my forties and yeah. I'm going, what the heck happened? You know, I was the it girl. I had it all going on. And now I'm in my forties and everything's falling apart. Yeah, yeah. And and so you just, I got really like, okay, never again. Like this is what we're doing. And so I got very interested in what everybody else was doing instead of 
focusing so much on my self pity and what I was doing. Yeah. And that's when things I think that's when I started really getting momentum because I, I was getting out of my own way so that I could be open to learning and getting into a different business. And that's how I ended up in the business that I'm in now. And right. I called, I called, I called the person and who did my life insurance. Yeah. And he did my life insurance back in 1998 with my ex-husband. Oh, right. right. Yeah. And I called him and I said, I was referring him business. And I said, Hey, if I keep referring you business, can I get a referral fee? And yeah. he was like, why don't you go get your license? And like, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Why don't I? Yeah. And so I did. And within a year I, I had done really well. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, you know, mainly because I was relentlessly not putting my phone down until I had at least one client a day. And, you know, I was wow, on a mission. Wow. I was on a mission. To so it's more phone work than footwork. Well, sales in general yeah, yeah, is, yeah. Is, Everything. is, 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 is you're dialing for dollars at all yeah, times, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. your sales is, you Teddy know, sales. one out of a hundred, maybe you hit, you yeah, know, yeah, and right, so yeah. anybody who's in sales knows it, that it's, there's it's, no easy, no, it's easy a numbers sale. game. Do you say it's a numbers game? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So it's just for hard sure. work. It's just hard work. If you know, you can, get through the kind of nose and, and the, the abuse because you do get some, I'm not going to talk to you in a minute about that because I've had a similar kind of journey to you recent in recent times because of the crisis of the pandemic you know um, I haven't really done too badly out of it but we'll talk about that in a minute um, but uh, so how did you go from doing that in one year to becoming a number you know the top five percent as I mentioned at the beginning of the intro for you in the in the u.s well, in my in my in my in, in my business in the in the firm that i chose to work with the thing that i like is that we work for the client we don't work for the company we don't work for all the carriers i'm not captive i don't work for one life insurance company that i'm only selling their products so i work for the client so my job is to go and find the best product for my client, yeah. which means I am licensed with all the carriers. Yeah. And it, or if I place business with them, I will get licensed with them. And so that is the big that's the big different differentiation between me and somebody who just works for one company. So I'm adding, I think, a lot more value because I'm more in the, the best interest of what I'm doing for the person I'm working for. And so with that in mind, you know, I'm looking at products all day long and I'm being introduced to things. And when something comes across to me that I go, I would want that, then I want to share that with all my clients. And that's kind of was my approach. Like if a product came across to me as something that I would want, then I shared it with everybody. And that's how I grew my business. You know, it started out where it was just one on one people that I knew. Yeah. And then as my business grew, I was fortunate that I got into uh, family offices, organizations, oh, right, business okay. managers. Uh, then it grew agents. again from there even more. It, of it, course. And then I'm it's bigger. in a more, more affluent yeah, yeah. group. And, you know, and I'm... Because a lot more, of that work is referral as well, isn't it? Everything in my business is referral. Yeah, because of yeah. life insurance. It's all people referral. Talk There's about. not a lot of marketing. It's all word of mouth. It's, yeah, yeah. you know, people the kind of business that I do, people know who we are and, and yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. Well, so what would you say the key to it was just really working at it? Like just hard work. Hustle. 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 <laughs> That's a good one. You know? and, a and good I one. Say, yeah. No, I have a, my phrase is no means maybe. And, and I, I say that in regarding sales, no means maybe it's like you, you might get 10 no's, but out of those 10 no's, somebody's going to come back around or they're going to refer you to somebody. You never know. So yeah, I never yeah. take no as the final, final, final. It's like it might be the final right now, but in a year from now, six months, two months, maybe tomorrow, it could all change. And so we never know. So I'm always like, I just want to always be open to possibilities. And I had a call two days ago somebody that reached out to me a year ago and and then said okay they changed their mind 
And then they called me back two days ago and they were in a panic. They were like, oh no, we need to do this now. And I was like, you know, so you never know what what's going to come back around or yeah yeah who's going to be your client or who's going to who's they may not be your client but they may refer you a ton of business you just never know so yeah, i yeah. just you know my my you know the way i work is is i'm always on the phone yeah and i i i just i have a sense of urgency that 90 percent of the people just don't have yeah and i know because i get very frustrated with people that i do business with not the clients, but the people that I'm trying to get the product from, they don't have the same sense of urgency that I have, you know? And so I just, that was something that I learned is that I have this very different, you know, like if somebody says we should do this, I go, okay, now's a good time. Let's do it. And it's like, not tomorrow. I don't want to sit here and think about it. Let's just do it. You know? And I, I just, I can't, it's really hard for me. And I know I frustrate people around me because I just don't understand when people go, oh, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And I'm like, no, I mean now. <laughs> like, why are you still standing here talking to me? Like, we got to do it now. And so I, I uh, you know, that's just how I work. And, yeah. and it's just the way I, I know that it works for me and the success that I've had, that nothing gets lost in my shuffle and if it does it's very rare i'm really the hard part about that though is that i have a hard time letting go of of control of the reins or the control of where these things are going or what you oh, know i'm so always you, like you, what's it's my baby that? i want to hold on to it <laughs> i don't want to let go yeah, of this you know, it's yeah, mine I, I, <laughs> like I, that I'm con- you know what's the ownership of it and, yeah 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 i know what you mean i know what you mean would you say that the, the I mean, obviously, listening to all this, you just uh, uh, mentioned and, and, and ex- experienced for your whole sales experience, um, you know, after the real estate and going into the life insurance, that first year of really plowing through and all of a sudden that first year, bam, boom, you're away, you know, it's, it's like, would you say that first year laid did foundations for you to really just excel and, and it becomes well, a yeah, snowballing you know, kind it- of you don't, you don't realize it. I mean, I, for me, I didn't realize when I was actually in it and all these things were happening and I was like, Oh my God, I got that sale. That's incredible. And, you know, but then I was completely onto the next, the next, the next. And I just was getting more and more wrapped up. And I remember like 2011, 12, 13 and 14, it was like, things were happening so fast that I really never took time to go, Oh, that's really good. You know, that's really good. And and then, you know, and then it, you know, when things slow down, this is really what I want people to understand is that when things slow down or there's a failure or there's a setback or a divorce or a death or whatever it yeah, is, yeah, whatever yeah. setback there is in life, yeah, that is where the emotional and the spiritual, yeah, all that growth takes place right. there. Yeah, yeah. not in the successes right you know that, i wasn't sense, in my yeah. success i wasn't in my success mindset getting all this growth although you can yes but for yeah. me the my deepest growth and in, in my spiritual and emotional life happened when i was in my darkest places it was like oh yeah 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 i need to learn something here something's not working quite right and i'm one of those people where i just i can't play small you know what I mean? And yeah. for a long time, I was playing, I was, I was playing really small, but I knew it intuitively that that just wasn't feeling right to me. I was like, why am I playing so small? I should be playing much bigger. And so then I started hanging out at places where bigger people hang out. Yeah. And I would force myself to sit in an environment that scared me and it made oh. me grow that yeah, forced yeah. me to talk to people that were smarter than me. I put myself yeah. in a room where people were smarter than me and would it would intimidate me and scare me and force me to grow and force me to learn and force me to understand that, you know what? You, it's so easy to get caught in our little bubbles and feel safe yeah. and be like, okay, everything's good. Everything's going just as planned. Okay. Don't rock the boat because everything's going really well. But those people scare me more because when things do fall apart, it's like a big, 
where if, if you know and you continually grow, you continually learn, you continually contribute, you continually are open and curious, that when these things happen, you're kind of like, okay, I have tools, you know, it's okay, because I'll do that or, you know, but when you're trying to play small and even, it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, and it's exactly. boring. Play and it it's big. boring, really, because, you know, you're, you're, it can be very fear-based to not want to change or do anything completely out of the box. Everything that I've done in the last 20 years has completely scared me to death, really, you know, like <laughs> past 20 years, you mean while you're doing the sales? With pe- I've been in, I've been in rooms with people in meetings that was so intimidating and I would, yeah, you know, yeah. you have to fake it till you make it. And right. I would just sit there and pretend I'm like I knew what they were talking about yeah, and, yeah. and then force myself to go and learn what it was we were talking about. Like, Oh, I better, better educate myself on that. You know? You know, because I was a full-time mom. I was raising yeah. three kids. And all of a yeah, sudden yeah. now I'm in a boardroom with people talking about insurance and, you know, premiums and policies and yeah, yeah. financing the premiums. And I, this is all <laughs> like, you're speaking Japanese, yeah, yeah. you know? And so, yeah, but taking but that licensing course, in, so. taking that license, you went through all that training anyway to, to know about these these various different Yeah, but the real training is not when you're, it's out not on, when you're studying out, for out in the field. The real yeah. training is when you're, when you're doing the work yeah i know yeah it's the experience side of it yeah yeah i mean i'm probably in a a different situation but obviously uh during the um well just before the pandemic you know i I had a bit of a jet set lifestyle i was going back to london um i retired as a firefighter but i was doing some personal training on the side because i was an athlete people said oh yeah you've got to be fit to be a firefighter because because they always saw me do my fitness training because it was part of you know sports was my other life outside Absolutely. and then socializing you know fit. with that because i was a bit of a yeah. you know i was living in the middle of london like living in central park in new york you know it's like <laughs> i had a good lifestyle but uh so you know i i kind of got some clients that way word of mouth and then when i left it was like oh, what do i do so I, I got some private firework at events like for a company um an x5 fire officer start an event so you know music events got to have fire cover and you know build certain buildings and you know things like that but it involved a lot of people so obviously during the pandemic both the fitness coaching and doing fire you know safety work at big music events is not allowed it's still not allowed now you know so so all yeah. that good money i was getting it's more yeah. money than i was getting paid as a firefighter and you know obviously my my, yeah. my pension is lower you know so it's like what do i do now so um now i kind of pivoted because i was trying to do it all online and it wasn't working for me really i was learning more about marketing and all these sales funnels and yeah, yeah get this email list and things like that all this technical stuff and digital marketing and and I, started, look, I became more like that. But the thing that was growing was my podcast. You know, it sort of exploded, really. And I thought, wow, okay. And I just started this while I was doing all the, you know, the fire work and that, because that's all kind of like... So great, you know, it's yeah, like yeah, a casual lot of work. people looked at this, the pan- yeah, a lot of people looked at the pandemic as, you know, oh my God, doom and gloom. And I, for me, it was like a really great time to be innovative and creative yeah, yeah. And, and, and be really quiet with myself. And, yeah, yeah. And that, there was nowhere to be, really. There was nowhere to be, you know. Yeah, it's yeah, like that's right. Only just being being present to the fact that this was all happening, yeah. and and I was like, okay, how what what to do during a time of you know quiet? Yeah, exactly. And it, for that's me, a good time. Was, so I it was really great. Well, I was grateful for it, and yeah. I you know during that time I wrote a book and you know, decided to build a brand and, 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 and do something that I could give back because I, you know, I had, I had such a great 10 years in my, in my industry. And, and I thought, you know, I've had, I've had it really well, you know, and what can I do now to, to teach all the the things that the, the growth that I've had, what could I do to teach and move people forward that are stuck in some story or stuck in some situation that they feel like they can't change their life or reinvent their life. It's like, I say all the time, you know, this is it. I don't get it. This is it. I'm, you know, I'm in my fifties now I'm 57. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh, wow. I'm, I'm 56. And I feel, <laughs> yeah. So I yeah, feel yeah. like my but, life is just getting started. Well, I when, I like, you, when I saw you today, I, I thought, can you, get, can you get your mother? I thought you was a, I thought you was a daughter. Of the, you know, you look so young. But then people say I look young you. as well. Thank no, you. no, people say I look young as well. So um, yeah. I do actually. Yeah, and that's, know, that's so. the beautiful thing, right? Because yeah, yeah. We, are, we, we are. We are in a different time than our parents were or their parents were. We're in a different time. We're living longer. We have no excuse to be vital for as long as we want. Yeah. Exactly. And I just feel like life is just getting started. Like I'm like, I feel healthier and happier. I like to still now. work out, you know, I try to watch out what I'm eating sometimes, you know, so. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, look, let's, let's talk about your book. But before that, I mean, uh, there was an area of recovery and trauma that you're talking about. And I know you said, you, you know, using this lockdown as downtime is it's good. And I know it's good for people if you can maybe people that are, are going through this tough time at the moment, you know, trying to recover. And uh, yeah, you know, so. and it's really been a very difficult time for a lot of people, because unfortunately, a lot of people did go out of business and especially people who had their own mom and pop shops really had a hard time surviving i i saw it right here you know around where i live all these places that i used to love to go to and they're they're gone i've never walked around la and seen so many for lease signs ever and i've lived here my whole life really? i mean it, you know it really did it really did affect a lot of people so you know i have a lot of compassion and empathy for for that yeah. you know it's it's not easy, but you know this is the time to, to really use all resources and and the, the truth of the matter is we live in a time too where we, there's so much abundance. Yeah. There's just so many opportunities. There's so many things available now, that it's, it's kind of fun actually because there's so many ideas. People have so many ideas. I mean, you and I are on different in different parts of the world right now. Yeah. And yeah. we're talking about innovation marketing and sales and yeah, it's like yeah. how when did that happen you know yeah. it's so cool like i i get really i get like all geeky about it i'm like how cool is that like who would have thought on a friday at 7 20 my time i'd be talking to you and you're in australia it's like yeah 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 oh no i'm in the so philippines but, and, but i'm working for an australian Philippines. sorry sorry office. yeah they've yeah. got their office and yeah so, yes training comes yeah but i mean still yeah. it's like how cool is that that is so cool so the the possibilities are endless yeah yeah wow well, that's, just, that's fantastic so look, let's move on to your book now yeah. before we go um so so um what, what yeah, is your so, book about and, so and really so the book is basically the, my journey from being on the cover of playboy to being yeah. a businesswoman and and how did i go from one to the other and how did i pull myself out during dark times. Right. And so that's the journey. It's not a, it's not a, it's, it's more, it's really got a positive, it's positive for, yeah, yeah. I, I really want people to read it and go, if that happened to her and she can do it, then I can yeah, do yeah, it. Yeah. You know, I want people to feel like they can do it. I'm no different. You know, I, you know, I, I had to do this. I use the same tools as everybody else. Yeah. yeah. And it's a mindset, you know, so that's that's basically the the book. I'm I am currently launching a website, which yeah. will happen probably Monday or Tuesday. All and right, so okay. if you go to Insta go to Instagram and follow me on Instagram at Deborah Driggs. Yeah. And then that's where I'm going to post my website, and then okay. people can get a hold of me once once they start following uh, me on my website. Okay. Well, um, perhaps you can just drop drop it to me on on <clears throat> on an email because um, yeah. Uh, I want to make sure it's on the show notes for our, our listeners. And um, this will probably be out on uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, so about May the 5th, I think, something like that, 4th. Wonderful. Like that. So, so if you can just drop me an email with, with the website, <laughs> maybe hopefully before Monday, because I'm going to be, you know, editing and pr producing it quickly before that. But um okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm glad I can share some some similarities to your story as well. I wrote a book yeah. just be, just uh, just before I was retiring from the fire service. It's called Firefight from Within: How to Master the Tools of Life Even During Tough Times. A similar thing as a self help memoir type book to just inspire people. Um, so yes, it's... and that you know that's what we need right now more yeah, than ever. Exactly. Yeah, There's exactly. a reason why podcasts are just blowing up. Like oh, you said, you're it's doing, amazing. You're yeah. doing so well because. 
people are at home and 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 they need yeah. to, to yeah that and Netflix conversations and, <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, Netflix I'd binges and podcast binges <laughs> have been yeah. a big huge thing thanks uh, thank God for that during the lock, uh, lockdown anyway um, so it's better than binging on food all the time or something like that yeah. but anyway <laughs> Deborah, it's been a great pleasure. Oh, by the way, so what's much. the name of your book? What's the name, the name of your book and where's it coming it's, out? It's it's a working title, and the working title is I'm a late bloomer. And so it's that's not the name, but that's the working title. Okay. All right. So we'll, we'll have to have another one when, when it comes out. It's not come out yet in the book, yeah? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. we'll have another, no, we'll have another show just totally on the book, and then uh, okay. we'll get that promoted as well. So, uh, yeah, Yay. Deborah, Deborah, it's a great pleasure you uh, talking to Thank my you so the audience today. And uh yeah, we'll have you back again. Thank you as Wonderful. well. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right.